In 1982, the UK surprised everyone with its resolve going all in to defend the Falkland Islands, halfway around the world. Imagine a similar situation. The US vacates the Indian Ocean, then India decides to flex its muscle and control it, including the British island territories, smack in the middle of the ocean. In this video, India will be gearing up for an attack as the UK turns those islands into a fortress, with the Royal Navy virtually relocating to defend the Indian Ocean. Would the British succeed in defending its territory from the world's fourth biggest air force and possibly the seventh biggest navy? Enemy intercepting electronic emissions could give away the position of an entire naval fleet. It's thus imperative such interceptions are not possible. Be it in war or for your private use, keeping your internet connection secure can be crucial. Yes, this video is sponsored by NordVPN, a virtual private network which will do just that, secure your internet. You can install it on your mobile device or your computer. NordVPN will encrypt and send all your data through its own servers. There are over 5000 servers in 59 countries to choose from. Effectively, you can connect to the internet from a different country if you want to. Multiple connections are allowed, as is peer-to-peer -peer sharing, and bandwidth is unlimited. NordVPN is celebrating its birthday and so every purchase of a two-year plan will get you one additional month free and a surprise gift. Click on the link below or go to nordvpn.com slash binkov to find out more. NordVPN gives a 30-day money-back guarantee, so why not try it? Happy 9th birthday, Nord! Let us get back to our video. Our usual rules apply. The Indian Ocean is huge. To control it, one needs to cover massive distances. Controlling it with ships sailing from the British mainland would be impossible. Ships would have to go into rotation due to maintenance. Over a long enough time period, the British would be lucky to upkeep one third of their ships and subs. India would have the luxury of choosing the time of their campaign and amass their force to perhaps two thirds of their current naval capacity. Without the base, the best Britain could do is control the southern reaches of the ocean, where Indian assets would suffer similar fleet availability woes. Luckily for the British, they do have the British Indian Ocean Territory, an archipelago with one military base, largely funded and built by the US in the 70s. The British do retain full access. To give the British a fighting chance, in this scenario they will move as much military force as they can onto the island, before India decides to attack. The base on Diego Garcia features decent port facilities. It usually houses several US large cargo ships of a US naval squadron. So sustaining a force of a few dozen ships spread over time would be plausible. Another important asset is the airbase. The UK would be deploying Eurofighters and various support planes. Sensor planes and tankers would be in action too, and a myriad of helicopters operating from newly cleared landing sites. The Indians could go about it two ways. One of the ways would be to go for one big strike, overwhelming British defenses. The Indian Air Force is huge compared to the Royal Air Force. This list omits the eight Rafale jets that recently got delivered. Training for their operational use is not finished yet. Jaguars are single-role strike jets, thus their poor score. MiG-21s are quite old and they lack range to reach Diego Garcia. Tejas is a light fighter with a low payload. It would not be effective to use up refueling assets to extend its reach. Similar issues would apply to land-based MiG-29s, which have been thoroughly modernized. Mirage 2000s have not all been modernized yet, but their reach is longer. But the most important Indian asset would be its Su-30 MKIs. Those have not seen major upgrades since they entered service. The Royal Air Force has shrunk considerably in numbers over the decades. But any Indian plane hoping to reach Diego Garcia would depend on in-air refueling, limiting actual local Indian numbers in a fight. The British, however, can't hope to house more than several dozen Eurofighters to Diego Garcia. Technically, there is plenty of apron space for more, but facilities are needed to service so many planes, and other larger planes would need room as well. Cramming the base with parked planes could spell disaster if there is some Indian missiles sneaking through. India's biggest issue is the low number of in-air refueling tankers. The few that they do have face maintenance issues. The ferry range of a plane is one thing, it's basically efficient cruising without a load. 
but with weapons carried, speed dashes and maneuvers, the actual combat radius is often roughly around a third of the ferry range. Each plane would need one refueling rendezvous on the way to Diego Garcia and one more on the way back. A fleet of five illusions might enable almost 40 Sukhois to reach the island for a short ground strike. India did also procure an unknown number of body refueling stores for their Sukhois. Some similar stores are also available for their MiG-29s. Of course, both sides have an aircraft carrier as well. Well, the British technically have two. But in reality, only one of those would actually be carrying jet fighters. The first reason for that is that the Prince of Wales still needs more time to get its crew trained. But the bigger reason is that the UK simply lacks the fighter jets to fully populate even one of those big ships. Due to maintenance and training, the carrier might operate just 16 fighters. The other carrier might be used as a helicopter carrying platform, or as a replacement carrier, when the first one gets worn out or damaged. India's sole carrier is smaller, but India does have more planes ready for it. The whole air fleet numbers 41 MiG airframes, but the ship would embark with fewer. Indian ships would also operate aerial early warning choppers. Useful against ships and some other aircraft, but not really useful against stealthy F-35s. The British would depend on their land-based AWACS. It would be crucial to keep that airbase open for operations. Amassed Indian submarines would go first, as they are slow. Their subs are of French, Russian and German design. None have air-independent propulsion, so they can't go undetected for long periods of time. Except for their two nuclear fueled subs. One is Russian and the other is an indigenous design, meant to carry nuclear-tipped ballistic missiles. Facing those, the British would send as many of their 11 subs as they can. The vanguards are also nuke missile carriers, but even such submarines could at least sniff around using sonars. Nuke subs can quickly and quietly change location. Conventional subs when recharging batteries would be at risk, operating near the surface. Larger and newer British subs would be finding Indian ships and firing on them more often. A bigger threat to the British subs might be Indian aircraft and helicopters configured for anti-submarine missions. But those would be effective only in areas of the ocean where India can control the skies. The Royal Navy is behind in the number of anti-submarine aircraft, though its helicopters are more capable than Indian ones. The first order of business for India would be to try to neutralize the Diego Garcia airbase with standoff missiles. Shutting down all runway surfaces would require landing several precise hits. Then the whole airbase would be useless for at least several hours. So a strike force of further dozens of Indian planes could come in to keep the base shut down. Detecting submarines that can launch Russian club missiles would be almost impossible, but the missiles themselves are slow and in low numbers, so intercepting some could be viable. Then again, even the missiles that don't get intercepted might not achieve precise hits. But just two well-placed hits could prevent large planes such as AWACS from being used. Brahmos missiles are super fast and it's hard to react to them in time, but those would be launched from surface ships only. So the ships would need to survive getting to the launch distance, which in turn requires continuous air cover. But it's another thing to upkeep dozens of planes in the air 24-7. Assuming the Indian fleet is mostly safe up to 700 miles from its shore and that it would fire its missiles from 200 miles away from the British base, that's still 400 miles during which they would need air cover. The fleet would still need protection for at least 11 hours, and with the refueling mentioned previously, each Sukhoi would have less than 2 hours of time on station, meaning at least 5 such waves would be needed, as the British would be monitoring the situation from afar and would not attack until there are fewer planes in escort. So while India could have perhaps 80 planes from land bases and its sole carrier in the air during a two-hour period, during a longer period the average would be just a smaller part of that figure. The British would likely send all F-35s they could, and a few dozen Eurofighters. It's likely the British planes would be outnumbering Indian ones. Indian ships would need to stick together for mutual protection, and jets would need to rush forward a bit to protect their ships it's not likely ship-based air defenses would come into play. Sam's own Indian ships are not numerous and generally lack range, 
maximum ranges are likely not applicable against fighter jet type targets. Getting back to the British, they would need to first know an attack was launched. But as soon as the Indian task force does start sailing south, it would be hard to keep it secret. A massive fleet sailing fast is bound to make noise. British subs would track it from quite a distance. Satellites might then also help to further pinpoint their location. And ships are easily detectable from the air. The closer the fleet gets, the bigger the chance it would get detected. If by nothing else, then by one of the numerous helicopters. Attacking the Indian fleet would be more tricky for the British. First off, they would likely not be able to count on their ships. Simply rushing forward would find the British outgunned, as Indian fleet has more anti-ship missiles and of greater range. But ultimately, those British ships would need to protect the island base itself. Their SAM systems would be indispensable in protecting against possible cruise missiles. Of course, sticking too close to the island would mean their location would be easy to predict, so some early ambushes by Indian submarines might be possible. Also, not fanning out at least a bit might lead to delayed detection of Indian threats. British submarines would definitely go out forward to attack the Indians at the same moment the air attack commences, so they enjoy some air cover. When it comes to such anti-shipping warfare, India simply outclasses the Royal Navy. Their Termit missiles are obsolete, but the plentiful K-35s are comparable to Britain's own harpoons. And India also uses Russian club missiles, twice the range of harpoons. Finally, many ships use BrahMos missiles, which probably have the best electronics out of all missiles mentioned. Indian ships are simply very heavy on firepower, carrying more missiles in general. Also, Indian subs largely use anti-ship missiles. Those are generally of shorter reach. The Royal Navy subs retired their missiles in 2003. And the surface fleet is lagging behind. Their harpoons were supposed to be retired in 2018, as they were so old, but they recently got a few more years. British submarines would try to do the lion's share of work. While their initial torpedo attacks might be deadly, those would also disclose the submarine's location. A few subs lost would be more than likely. Even if they sink a dozen Indian ships, that might not be enough. It would all be up to air power then. But the British have some serious issues there as well. First, the British planes would need to fight through Indian air cover. Their Eurofighters have as good avionics as Indian planes, or a bit better. And F-35s have an even greater advantage in radar, jamming and missile warning systems. Indian planes use less capable missiles on average. The indigenous Astra missile is only starting to get integrated into the Sukhoi fleet, and the Mirage's Mika is of shorter reach. Both sides would use AWACS-type planes to keep track of the enemy from hundreds of miles away. Indian AEW helicopters can't see as far away as fixed-wing planes. Given the bigger numbers and the technological edge, the air battle would likely result in a British victory. But that would require most of the British planes, not leaving enough for a mass anti-shipping attack right away. So after a few hours, but still before India manages to refuel the refueling tankers and send in several more sets of escort planes, the British would strike with their planes. The UK retired its Sea Squaw helicopter launched missiles a few years ago. Even if the UK tries to rush into service the Martlet missiles for its Wildcat helicopters, it would not really work. The missile is tiny, with much too short of a range for helicopters to survive the launch. So would the Typhoons just waltz in, fire anti-ship missiles from a safe distance and call it a day? Well, no. Because the UK never bought or integrated any air-launched anti-ship missiles on those. Typhoons could use laser-guided bombs. A high-altitude, high-speed launch could yield a reach of over 20 miles. But targeting a maneuvering ship would require course corrections, so the actual range might be 15 miles. All those typhoons would be fired upon by Indian SAMs. We're talking well upward of 50 missiles in a single salvo. Those typhoons wouldn't have the luxury to simply eject their bombs to help evade missiles, as there might not be enough time for another attack run. Once bombs would be ejected, those planes would still need to stick around. Targets need to be laced. It's not unlikely a dozen typhoons would perish before bomb ejection, with another dozen before the bombs hit. 
When a plane marking the target swerves to evade a missile or gets killed, the bomb's guidance gets compromised. And guiding several bombs to several targets takes time, as it can't be done fully in parallel. Some bombs would inevitably miss. A lasing would be obscured with a heavy Indian-made smokescreen. Some bombs would be intercepted by closing defense systems. But some hits would be likely. Still, the Indian fleet would be big enough that the better part would still sail on. Would the F-35s fare better in such a bomb attack? Somewhat. Their stealth might protect them from being fired at, up until they close in or increase their rate of return by opening the weapon bay doors. Still, with such proximity and so many different angles from different ships targeting the F-35s, some would get hit. Whether that's several or a dozen planes is impossible to say. After two such waves, though, the Indian fleet might be left quite battered. With two dozen ships available for the mission and a dozen of those sunk, the remainder would be quite vulnerable. Perhaps a better option for the Typhoons, one not available to the F-35s, would be the Brimstone 2 missile. Its warhead is tiny, so several hits would be needed to mission neutralize a ship, and sinking a ship would be impossible. But it's got potent seekers, it can self-guide itself after firing and see through smoke. It's faster and harder to intercept, and features a longer reach. If it can be fired from 30 miles away, a plane could avoid the reach of most Indian defenses. A low approach might also work. Typhoons might fly over the ocean waves below radar horizon and might close in to 15 miles, then shoot up and release their missiles. Such an approach should still cause fewer losses than the high altitude bomb run. And the 300 or so brimstone missiles flying towards Indian ships would likely cause serious damage to various subsystems. Enough so that the Indian attack might be called off. If India does press on, the remaining ships may not be able to launch as many cruise missiles towards the island base. Most damage to the base itself would be repairable, in hours or days. But lost ships and planes can't be quickly replaced. Those British ships with their SAMs would be crucial, to be close by and to reduce the number of incoming cruise missiles. The land-based SAM defenses would help some, but not that much. Most units lack good sensors and reaction times against cruise missiles. Even if no Indian ship was intercepted, there would hardly be 100 cruise missiles flying. With half of the fleet sunk, the final missile count hitting the island would be fairly small, with survivable consequences for the British. The UK would lose several subs, possibly half a dozen ships to Indian submarines, and a few dozen aircraft. Indian losses would be graver, preventing them from repeating such an attack for a few years to come. But remember when we said one big attack is just one of India's options? Here's the other one. India could use the whole year to sporadically sail with their submarines very slowly, so they can keep on chugging on battery power for longer, and look for clear opportunities to engage British ships, simply slowly wearing down the Royal Navy and to do the same with their air force. Send waves of planes with almost no air-to-ground weapons. One wave of 80 planes every week or so, if needed. Even if the British, through their better technology and aid of SAM systems, managed to shoot down two Indian planes for the loss of one of their own, the long-term math would be in India's favor. Eventually, after several such battles, the British might lose most of their deployable air fleet while India would still have over 300 planes of sufficient range left. Certainly, waiting longer so both sides can prepare would suit India more, as it could gear up its forces towards more standoff missile attacks. The British don't have as much room for quick improvement. When the British do lose their air cover, the battle would be over within weeks. The islands are too tiny to support a large defensive ground force. India would eventually take them. Of course, all this applies if the UK is already in position before the attack. If India starts its strikes on the island while the British forces are still largely back in the UK, it would be a quick and easy victory for India. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together. <laughs>